Well, hello and welcome. My name is Danette Fenton Menzies. Now, I just want to check that the sound is good for today. If you can give me a thumbs up in the chat box, that would be awesome, or just even a thumbs up would be great. And I just will check my headset. I've got new headsets, and I'm just not entirely sure, though, that I've got it right. All right, looks like it's all good. So let's begin. Welcome, and my name is Danette Fenton Menzies. And today we are in the second of our series around navigating lockdown. And today we're going to be looking over at navigating emotions. And I'd like to start this session by um, acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land from which I'm coming in today, which is the Wiradjuri people. And I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and also to um, extend that respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who are on today's webinar. So welcome. I hope you've had a lovely week so far. I know it is still locked down and it is extremely frustrating. Um, at the moment today, we have a stunning day where I am. So I hope it's a stunning day where you are as well. Now, today in our conversation, we're going to talk about what are emotions and then how do we navigate them to be able to um, feel good or as good as we can through this lockdown so that our, navigate, our emotions don't necessarily hijack us all the time. So I've got a question. I'd love um, any answers you've got in the chat box and it's what is the difference between feelings and emotions we often do use them interchangeably so i'm curious what what do you think are the differences between them yeah, it's complex isn't it <laughs> it's not an easy question so i won't i won't make you suffer anymore <laughs> so what i've learned through my research is feelings are things that are either brought about by emotional experiences, but they can also be due to physical experiences, for example, or physical sensations. For example, we might feel tired or we might feel hungry. So they tend to be, our feelings tend to be conscious because we notice them. Our emotions are a little different because they are actually more unconscious. And it basically starts in our brain. So, there's a part of our brain called the amygdala, which is where our emotions really start. And what happens is they call this the command center of our emotions. And really what it is, is it looks at what's going on outside of our body and assesses whether that is something that is safe and maybe something that it would be fun to move towards, or whether it's something that is more of a threat and therefore we want to move away from. So what happens once this part of our brain is scanning the environment is it's also doing a number of different things. So it might change our breathing for argument's sake. Our pupils might dilate or they might shrink. Um, our heartbeat certainly would change. Hormones would, and um, a number of chemicals would be put into our bloodstream to make sure that we are ready for whether you know, it's a, something that's a good thing or something that's not a good thing. So those emotions happen both you know, in our brain, but also throughout our body. So it requires a little more checking in on yourself to actually be able to work out what is it that I'm experiencing in terms of an emotion. And it's often much easier to label the actual feeling that you're feeling. But remember, some of your feelings come from physical sensations rather than just what's going on in your brain. Um, a really interesting thing is the different cultures that you grow up and live in also have an impact on our emotions. So different cultures have different words for emotions. And for example, and I found this in a book, the Pintupi peoples of Western Australia have over 15 different um, feelings for fear. So for them, that's obviously something that is um, really important. And so they're able to distinguish different types of fear um, by connecting into their body. Now, my joke for the day, um, hungry is a feeling, but hangry could be an emotion. 
<laughs> my husband knows when I'm hangry to feed me and, and do that quickly. <laughs> Otherwise, it goes downhill from there. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed my joke. <laughs> so, yeah, one of the things we should do throughout the day is check in on just what am I feeling today? And I love this um, photo and I really would like to give a big shout out to Unsplash. It's a website where people share their photographs um, and you don't even have to acknowledge who the photograph is, but I always like to. Um, and this is a beautiful one of what we could all be going through. So we could be sitting next to a number of people and we're all feeling different emotions. The thing is, these emotions go on inside of us all the time. There's a, a fabulous book on emotions, um, and it's called The Book of Human Emotions, and it's by a, a lady called Tiffany Watt-Smith. And in it, she said that she's identified or there have been identified at least 154 different emotions. Isn't that amazing? 154 so one of the things we know is that if we're going to navigate our world with other people and, and also understanding ourselves, then being able to tune into our emotions and our feelings is actually super important. And we talk about this as a skill called the emotional intelligence skill. And there's a whole stack of different elements to emotional intelligence. The, the thing about emotional intelligence is that it's understanding the emotions you're experiencing and understanding what's going on for others and particularly understanding the impact that if you're not aware of your emotions, they could have on others. So you become aware of this is an emotion that might be safe to share with others. This one, maybe I need to go off and do a little bit of work on. Now, the thing is, there's a strong correlation between people who get to understand their emotions and them having greater resilience. And the outcome of greater resilience is that we are able to make better decisions. We tend to be more empathetic. We also tend to be more aware, which means we have less impact on others that is um, something that we hadn't thought about when we were feeling those emotions. And one thing for me that um, I think is really important why we do develop our emotional intelligence skills is that um, the Center for Creative Leadership did a study where they said that 75% of careers derail due to um, people not building these emotional competencies. So in terms of something that will boost your career, being good at emotional intelligence absolutely is amazing. Um, and being poor at it, as I said, leads to up to 75% of careers derailing. So it's certainly something that's worth investing time and energy in. And the lovely thing is that emotional intelligence can be grown. So you can build it. It's not something that's fixed at birth or you know, in your childhood. So one of the things I know about emotions is that emotions actually are signals to us. So they're signaling whether something is um, something we want to move towards because it looks more rewarding. It looks like it might create things like happiness, joy, et cetera, or it might be something that we want to move away from. So it's a potential threat or something that doesn't feel really good. And in fact, we even do this with people. So our brain is hardwired to look for threats more than it looks for rewards. So in fact, about 64% of our thoughts are based on our brain scanning the environment, looking for threats. So we tend to have, even if you're a positive person, we tend to have more negative thoughts than positive ones unless we catch ourselves. So this is where the awareness is really important. When we meet someone for the first time, our brain sees them as a foe, which is the threat side, versus a friend. Now, one of the things that we can do that makes this change really fast is to do this. The moment we smile at another person instinctually, and it's got to be a proper, genuine smile, instinctually, the other person will smile back and they will get that we are more of a friend rather than a foe. And obviously, the moment we smile... You know, if you check in at your feelings, your body sort of tends to feel you know, nice. And the emotions there are going to be those more positive ones. So paying attention to what we feel is actually really important and what emotions are going on in us. And this is one of the ways that we can raise our self-awareness. And self-awareness is a key element of emotional intelligence. 
So something to be aware of is that strong negative emotions generally represent either that a value, a need or a want is not currently being met. So the moment we feel something strong, if we can go, okay, what is that feeling? Maybe what's the emotion underneath it? We can ask ourselves an even better question, which is what is the value or the need or the want that isn't being fulfilled at the moment within me? That's a really beautiful way to boost your self-awareness. Now, obviously, you need to work on understanding what are the strong values that you have? What are the needs that are really important to you? And also, what are your wants? So understanding them then helps you notice if you have a nice, strong, positive feeling, which is those values, needs and wants are probably being met versus the negative where they're not being met. So for me, um, asking people, what are your triggers is actually a really important thing. For all of us, we should examine what are the things that trigger me for those strong emotions. So I wonder, what are some of the things that trigger you? Now, I'll share one of mine while you uh, can put some answers in the chat box. Um, one thing that used to trigger me was people who were late. And that was because I was brought up in a household where one of our strong values around respect was being on time. Now, I've since got over that particular one, although I still find myself from time to time getting a little bit stressed. And I'll notice that feeling and I'll go, oh, OK, that's about, you know, what was at home where we needed to be on time? Now, that doesn't mean I try to be late or anything. But for me, I noticed that and now can go, oh, that's about that value of respect. And in our family, respect equaled being on time. You know, for some people, it's being, um, and for most people, this would be being spoken over. Uh, yeah, being ignored is another one. Yeah, feeling like people are, yeah, using you you know so that it's it's not a reciprocal relationship where there's some give and take it seems like it's all take no give yeah so again once we've got that awareness we can start to explore what's the value or the need or want and understanding where though where we feel good they're probably being met and where we don't feel so good that we probably they're probably not being met and certainly during lockdown, some of those strong negative emotions are happening. And we're seeing it with um, a number of ways that people are you know, playing out on social media and out in public because people have these strong needs or wants. Um, and it's hard because we're all different. So not everyone's needs or wants are the same. So one of the things that I think is really important important is to think, well, what makes it so hard for us to navigate our emotions? And one of the things I know is the moment we come up against our comfort zone, anything outside that feels uncomfortable. And often in society, we are encouraged not to share strong emotions. In fact, often it's not share negative emotions at all or what we would label as negative, or some people call them bad emotions. They're not really bad. They're just actually data or information. So know that the moment you start to feel uncomfortable, which is often why people won't share their emotions or aren't able to navigate them, or they feel, feel bad about hurting someone else's um, feelings, then what that is, is we're hitting our boundary of our comfort zone. And in fact, if we want to grow, particularly from an emotional intelligence perspective, then we need to get used to that discomfort. It's okay to sit with an emotion and let it basically bubble up, particularly if it's a strong one. In fact, I read somewhere that really an emotion takes about 90 seconds to process. So if we sit with that discomfort, it'll go pretty quickly. But what usually happens is we push it down. And the moment we push it down, it stays with us. And later on, if we keep pushing it down, it usually comes out in big dramatic ways at the worst possible time. So a phrase that my husband um, taught me, which I really love, is get curious about your emotions. Don't get furious. And the moment you notice those feelings Try to identify what's the emotion, what's the need or want or the value behind that particular feeling. The other thing that I love to do is journal. So journal allows me to put the thoughts, what I've noticed, 
down on paper to examine them better. And it's a really good way of becoming more aware. The other thing is, as we've been talking about, identifying what are the needs or wants that this feeling relates to. One of the things that people often steer away from and why they often won't journal is that they're worried that the moment they label that feeling or that emotion, that it's going to make it worse. In fact, what the brain science has shown is it, it actually makes it better. The moment we're able to label something, it means the blood flows here and we've become aware of what's going on for us. The moment that happens, the part of the brain that does all of the emotional stuff, the amygdala, actually calms down because our brain understands when we're aware of it, so it's up here, that we actually have capacity to deal with it. So labelling an emotion is actually a great way to calm your brain down. The other thing, and we spoke about this in last week's conversation, was that um, there's a, a thing called image management. And apparently, according to a study, that about 33% of people's times in offices were in office or workplaces where um, we're not able to share what's really going on for us, people spend that time image management. So pretending that they're okay when maybe they're not. Now, what we know is again, that it's healthy not to deny what's going on. Now, obviously you need a safe place to be able to do that. And hopefully as people learn more about this, they'll start to understand that when a colleague shares that they're feeling not so great today, maybe they're sad, that we don't need to fix it, but we also don't need for them to hide that, that it's okay to, to acknowledge and respect those particular feelings. So for example, you can actually say something like, I'm noticing that I'm feeling and insert the feeling. Again, by doing that, you've labelled it and you're going to start calming your brain. And if others are aware of that, they can become aware that, okay, today is not going to be potentially your most productive day, but that's not going to go on forever. So for me, one of the things I um, really am grateful for in this current lockdown is it's the reminder that we got really busy once the lockdown stopped. And this is a perfect time to come back and learn a little bit more about yourself and what's important for you. Because at the end of the day, a really rich life is a life that's, that's lived doing um, what is important to you. So living by your values, making sure that your needs are met. I read a fabulous book this week, and I'm going to do a book review, so you'll see it come out shortly, by The Minimalists. And um, they were talking about how we often bring clutter, so lots of items into our life in order to not notice what's actually going on for us from a feeling and an emotional perspective. And the thing I loved about this book is it actually then asked really insightful questions to get people to identify what was actually really important in their life. And generally, it's not things, it's actually people and connection. Now, I just wanted to share a simple tool, which we've shared a number of times, but for me, it's really helpful in understanding um, your emotions. And this is the emotional pendulum. So when our emotions are high positive, everything's awesome, super pumped. What our brain does is really interesting. It's like apparently being on a drug high. So in that space, we actually only see the 50% of the world that is positive. So if you look from the plus sign down to the neutral or the end sign, we see that basically our brain focuses on that positive side. Now, if you've ever been super pumped and purchased something and then calmed down and went, oh, what was I thinking? That buyer's remorse is exactly what your brain did. It actually filtered out any of the negative stuff and just concentrated on the positive stuff. When you calmed down, you saw both the positive and the negative. The same happens when we're feeling strong negative emotions. 
our brain focuses on the negative. So it sees the 50% of the world that is from the negative side to the neutral. It tends not to see the positive side of things. So this is really not a great space to make decisions for argument's sake. And what happens, particularly when we um, feel like we're losing control, our brain tends to narrow the neural pathways in it so that it um, blocks out the positive opportunities and actually just get stuck on the problem. So the best space to live most of our life is in the centered or neutral space where nothing's good or bad, except for the moment we label it, because the moment we label, label it awesome or a catastrophe, there's a whole stack of chemicals that go through our blood flow, sorry, our, our system, and it creates those emotions, etc. So when we just say it is what it is, it's not good or bad, it just is, then our brain is more open and more curious. And we are far more likely to feel peaceful, which is a beautiful space to live in, rather than stressed on the negative side, or angry or frustrated, or on the positive side, you know, super excited, amazing, awesome, which can actually be quite exhausting over time as well. So remind yourself, it's not good or bad, it just is what it is. And take a couple of deep breaths, beautiful way to navigate life. N not saying block those emotions, just notice, has your language triggered some of those emotions? Now, one of the things our brain does, and this is something particularly at the moment with lockdown, is the moment it goes more to that negative side, our brain tends to catastrophize what's going on. And this is a beautiful photo of a storm. And it is really that reminder that we need to remind our brain that this too will pass. Just like a storm passes, these emotions, these feelings will pass. And the best thing we can do is become aware of them because then we can go, okay, what can I change to get a better result if I'm not liking how I'm feeling or the emotions I'm experiencing? So Robin Sharma shared with us, with better choice, sorry, with better awareness comes better choices. With better choices comes better results. So the moment we catch those emotions, we can get curious about them. What's the value that might not be working for me at the moment? So is one of my values being disrupted or disrespected? Is it a need or a want that's currently not being met? And one of the best things you can do, if you want a really short way to sort of boost how you feel, is to do this. We can prime our brain by smiling. The moment we genuinely smile, again, the feel-good chemicals come into our bloodstream. We're going to feel a little bit better. The other one that is super important is to do gratitude because the moment you go to gratitude, you swing from the negative side because it's usually, you know, gratitude's beautiful, peaceful, calm space. It reminds us, you know, our life is okay versus where our brain goes more negative and far more judgmental and less curious. Gratitude's far more about curiosity, much more about that neutral or centered state. And the thing I'd say that you know, can really help here is self-care. So simple things such as eating good whole foods, making sure that you stay hydrated. What are some other things you love to do for self-care? So I'd love for you to share in the chat box some of the things you do. The other one is noticing your sleep, making sure that you get enough sleep. So a lot of people we spoke last week um, are getting distracted a lot by devices. So creating device-free time just to give your body time to settle and for you also to come into your body rather than being distracted by the, the screen. Oh, I love this. Do skincare or oh, moisturize and look after your body for self-care. I love that, connection. Thank you for sharing that. And you know what? The beautiful thing about that is because you're touching yourself, a sense of touch self-soothes. So those beautiful things are actually beautiful for looking after yourself. Great suggestion. And it, it relates to connection. So some people at the moment you know, are by themselves. So you can't necessarily, um, you know, within the COVID requirements, you know, touch others. But even just being able to touch yourself through, you know, moisturising, self-care, et cetera, beautiful. Obviously, if you're with others, you know, if you can hold someone's hand, if it's safe or hug your partner, et cetera, all of those 
can help just soothe us because connection soothes our brain. It makes us feel safe. Um, the other thing I'd say is exercise is super important. Journaling can really help, again, bring back that awareness. And meditation or mindfulness can be really helpful. Now, they don't need to be complicated. Last week, we spoke about the sound OM. So let's practice this together because it's actually a really nice way to um, you know, just bring you back into your body and it calms your heart rate. So let's. I'm going to close my eyes. Om. Om. Just even those two deep breaths and that sound has made me feel more peaceful. I'm curious if you did it, how do you feel having just done two OMs. For me, it's just a beautiful way of slowing down. And that's a very quick meditation. It's even just a mindful practice. To remember that while we might be feeling not so great now, please remind your, your brain when it's in that negative space that this too shall pass. Now I'm curious, because we always like reflections at the end of conversations. What is it that you uh, would like to keep doing because it's working for you and it's helping you to navigate your emotions? What are some things you might want to start doing and just maybe one thing? Or is there something you need to stop doing or maybe even just reduce doing? So in the chat box, I'd love for you to share. And for me, because I'll, I'll share one of the things I've started doing again is in the mornings going for beautiful walks down our country road. Um, my cousin has canola in the paddock opposite me or opposite our, our house yard. And every day there's just a little bit more of yellow and yellow is such a gorgeous colour. So this you know, is, is really the end of today's session. Um, we would encourage you to um, connect with us online. Every week we're going to do a different um, half an hour conversation. And from next week, what I'm going to do is make it a meeting rather than a webinar. So people can actually join and speak as I'm talking as well, rather than just using the chat box. So please join us every Thursday at um, 12.30 for half an hour for lunch if you've got some time. Next week, we're going to um, look at how do we communicate better, given we're probably all a little bit more stressed. The other thing I'd encourage is on Fridays, we use Spotify's Green Room app and we have a live podcast and that happens at 12.30 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Times on Friday. So Thursdays and Fridays, you can um, speak to us live either on our conversations on Thursday or in the Spotify Green Room on Fridays. So until next time, can I say thank you very much for joining us and stay well and stay magical. And I'm sending you some virtual hugs. Thank you. Thank you.